He was the self-proclaimed Messiah who looked like a rock star. A mesmerizing personality and passionate Bible knowledge combined to allow him to gain ascendancy over a small group of followers, to manipulate them, use them for his sexual desires, and prepare them for his own version of Armageddon. Vernon Wayne Howell, the child who would become David Koresh, was born on August 17, 1959, in Houston, Texas. His mother, Bonnie Clark, was just 14 at the time, while his father, carpenter Bobby Howell, was a 20-year-old drifter who abandoned his pregnant girlfriend when another girl caught his eye. Bonnie soon took up with a man who was a violent drunk. They were married, with the union lasting for just two years. They proved to be tortuous years for the infant, who would often recall in later life how his stepfather mistreated him. When the marriage was dissolved, Vernon was taken in by his maternal grandmother, Elaine Clark. He grew into a likable but mischievous child who was highly active. In fact, he was given the nickname Sputnik due to his boundless energy in recognition of the Soviet satellite. By age six, Vernon was taken back in with his mother. Bonnie had just married a man by the name of Roy Haldeman. When he moved in with his mother, she was pregnant again, and in 1966, she gave birth to Vernon's younger brother, Roger. Vernon struggled in school, unable to keep up in elementary school to the extent that he was placed in a remedial class. The other kids in his school soon had a nickname for him. Mr. Retardo. Years later, Vernon recalls the effect that this ostracism had on his self-esteem. I mean, you're, you know, here comes the retarded kids, and it's like I stopped in my tracks. It is believed that one of the main reasons that Vernon struggled academically was that he suffered from dyslexia, a condition which was little recognized at the time. He was also a stutterer. It was clear, however, that the boy wasn't stupid. He had a natural mechanical ability and loved nothing more than pulling gadgets apart and putting them back together again. By the time he was a preteen, Vernon's affinity with mechanics had morphed into a love for cars. It also led him, in a roundabout way, to music. Finding an abandoned, broken guitar in a barn, he fixed it up and began teaching himself to play. Vernon's other great interest was in religion. His family were Seventh-day Adventists, and his grandmother often had him accompany her to church. He was reared within the moral confines of that way of worship, which meant no chasing after girls, taking drugs, or going to teen parties. While his peers were engaged in those activities, Vernon was busy reading the Bible and watching everything religious that he could find on TV or read in books and magazines. By the age of 10, he was able to recite long passages of scripture and was giving his own mini sermons at home. As a preteen, Vernon was still a stutterer. He combined his passion for scripture with his efforts to overcome this speech impediment by listening to powerful sermons on the radio and then reciting the preacher's words. He would study and emulate the vocal skills of the speaker, discovering that when he did so, his stutter disappeared. Vernon's formal schooling finished when he dropped out during his junior year at Garland High School. The 18-year-old gained work as a carpenter in Garland. It was there that he began a relationship with a 15-year-old girl. When she fell pregnant, the girl's father became enraged. He forced his daughter to break off the relationship and warned Vernon to stay away. Vernon was in love with the girl, but saw no option but to heed the father's advice. By now, his family were living in Tyler, Texas. It was there that he approached his local Seventh-day Adventist elders and revealed his dilemma to them. He told them that he felt a moral obligation to marry the girl. He was surprised, however, when the elders tried to persuade him against doing so. He attempted to reason scripturally with them, only to find that they were getting angry with him. In the end, they simply ordered him to leave the church. As a result of Vernon's situation, not only he, but his entire family were excommunicated from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thoroughly disgusted with the organization, he began looking around for an alternative church. He was told about a group called the Branch Davidians, who were based in Waco, Texas. The Branch Davidians are an offshoot of an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists. This original group was founded in 1929 by a Bulgarian immigrant to the U.S. named Viktor Hutev. Originally called the Shepherd's Rod, the sect was set up in Waco, Texas. The group were convinced that the apocalypse was going to occur in 1929. 
1859. And when it didn't, a group broke away under the leadership of a man named Benjamin Roden. He called this group the Branch Davidians, in recognition of their holding to the coming restoration of the Davidic Kingdom of Israel. In 1978, Rodin died, and his wife, Lois, assumed leadership of the church. Vernon Howell arrived at the Branch Davidian compound in 1980. The 20-year-old had long, flowing hair, a charismatic personality, and a self-effacing manner. He appeared to be extremely spiritual to those that he met at the compound, holding to a strict moral code and judging himself as chief among sinners. He turned up with his guitar and a desire to use his music to reach young people with the message of the Lord. Lois Roden was immediately taken with Howell, and she invited him to move into the compound. Before long, the two became romantically involved, despite the fact that she was in her 60s. Lois began to give Vernon growing prominence as a teacher at the compound. She would give him time at the pulpit so he could expound his interpretations to the congregation. Vernon's preaching style was very different to what the churchgoers were used to experiencing. He wore a t-shirt and jeans and spoke with illustrations that were often startling in their directness. On one occasion, he likened sin to snot on a person's finger that he just can't get off. Above all, he acknowledged himself as imperfect, as weak, and as a sinner. Vernon's natural charisma, his unkempt looks, the down-to-earth style, and his deep scriptural knowledge were a potent mix. He purposefully positioned himself in the light of Jesus in opposition to the staid, formulaic, and hypocritical Pharisees of mainstream religion. His status was elevated even further when he began to proclaim the gift of prophecy. A few months after Vernon had moved in, Lois made the bombshell public announcement that she was pregnant with his child. She told her followers that this was all part of God's divine arrangement. However, she would go on to miscarry the baby. However, she still elevated Vernon as her spiritual heir and the next leader of the Branch Davidians. Many in the congregation were in agreement of Lois's consecration of Vernon as her successor, but there was one who was definitely not, and that would be Lois's son, George. George viewed Vernon as a dangerous usurper who had shamefully manipulated his way into his mother's good graces and was now poised to take over the leadership that was rightfully George's to inherit. Over the next three years, a power struggle was to play out between Vernon and George, with the congregation split between the two. Tensions came to a peak in 1984 when George and his armed supporters forced Vernon and about 25 of his followers to leave the compounds at Mount Carmel. For the next two years, this group was situated in Palestine, Texas, some 90 miles away, where they had to live in buses and tents. During this time, Vernon put his skills into building up his base of followers. Through his music and the power of his personality, he was able to attract new members from far and wide. In 1985, he traveled to Israel with his pregnant wife, Rachel Jones, who was one of the congregation members. It was while in the Holy Land that he became convinced that he was the modern-day incarnation of King Cyrus of Persia. He had been tasked, he claimed, with opening the seven seals of the Book of Revelation and proclaiming them to all the world. Back at Mount Carmen, George Rodent was acting increasingly erratically, which was causing his followers to decline rapidly. Many in the compound openly supported Vernon Howell and longed for his return. Lois Roden had died in 1986, and George was determined to eliminate the threat that Vernon posed to his leadership. He decided to call Vernon out by challenging him to a resurrection competition. The man that could successfully raise a dead person would be the acknowledged leader of the church. In order to achieve his ends, and now clearly psychotic George had a body exhumed. When Vernon heard about this, he went directly to the authorities and laid a complaint that George had been tampering with a dead body. He was told that the authorities could do nothing unless they had photographic evidence. In order to obtain the needed proof, Vernon led seven armed supporters into Mount Carmel. Before they could find the exhumed body, however, they were discovered by George's followers and a gunfight broke out. In the skirmish, Roden was wounded. The police broke up the battle, and Vernon and his followers were arrested and put on trial for attempted murder, only to later be acquitted of all charges. Over the next couple of years, as Vernon's following at Palestine grew, back at Mount Carmel, George became even more irrational. When one of his supposed followers challenged him, claiming to be the Messiah, George lost control and killed the man with an axe. This act saw him being sent to a hospital for the criminally insane.
With George now well and truly out of the way, Vernon and his followers re-entered the Mount Carmel compound. He was now the undisputed leader of the Branch Davidians. Not long after his return, he had his name legally changed to David Koresh. The word Koresh is the Hebrew name for Cyrus, who David was convinced he was the modern-day incarnation of. With his new name came the conviction that Koresh was more than a prophet. He was the modern-day Messiah, and the words that he spoke were of divine origin. As the 1990s dawned, David Koresh was a 30-year-old, self-proclaimed messiah with a young wife and two children. He presided over more than a hundred faithful adherents who lived together in a single large building. Having mastered the fusion of religious music and inspirational proselytizing, Koresh's marathon sermons could last all day and all night. Still, the believers would hang on his every word. Koresh began using his position as the revealer of God's will to announce supposedly divine decrees that were increasingly to his personal advantage. One of the most controversial was that all of the women in the complex were to be available to him at any time for his sexual pleasure. This included all of the married women as well. Koresh did not confine his sexual liaisons to adult women. Girls as young as 12 became his sexual partners. These girls had been convinced that to give themselves over to God in the form of Koresh was the greatest privilege that they could attain. The men at Mount Carmel, including those who were married, were to remain celibate. This was because there was only one seed that was holy, and it flowed from Koresh. As a result, the majority of the children at the complex were his. At the time of his death, he was father to 15 sons and daughters. While the majority of the Branch Davidians accepted this arrangement as the will of God, there were a handful of dissenters who left the church because of it. Some of those who left were Australian. When they returned back home to Australia, they went to the American Embassy, and child abuse charges were laid against Koresh. Back in the United States, other defectors made similar charges. In response to the allegations, Child Protective Services sent investigators to the Mount Carmel complex. Their specific brief, however, was to assess the validity of an accusation that children had access to firearms. Koresh, however, showed that all of the firearms were under lock and key, and Child Protective Services they closed the case. In the wake of the defections, Koresh became increasingly angry and violent towards his followers. When one woman expressed a desire to take her child and leave, he denied her permission, and to teach her a lesson, he raped her. He then went on to recount the incident as a warning to the congregation. At this time, his sermons they became darker, with a constant theme of the coming Day of Judgment. He told his followers that Armageddon was going to be initiated right there at Mount Carmel, and that they had to be prepared to give up their lives in order to usher in the Davidic Kingdom. By 1992, Koresh had imbued a siege mentality into the minds of his followers. The governmental authorities, they were agents of the devil, and they were preparing for a cataclysmic showdown with the true followers of God who were holed up at Waco. By divine inspiration, Koresh revealed that he had been instructed to stockpile weapons at the compound. David soon discovered that the trading of guns was a lucrative business, providing much-needed funds for the ongoing costs associated with the compound. He would have members buying up cheap weapons and then selling them at gun trade shows. Any excess money would be used to build up their arsenal. Meanwhile, the information about the presence of weapons at Mount Carmel had been passed on by the agents who had visited from Child Protective Services to the FBI, who had in turn given it to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. The ATF now began surveillance of the property. The situation went up a notch when a UPS delivery package was seen by agents to contain hand grenades, which were illegal. This discovery led to an eight-month investigation which revealed a trail of everything from grenade launchers to assault weapons ending up at Mount Carmel. By early November of 1992, the ATF had amassed enough evidence to take Koresh into custody. They were worried, though, that his followers, who sincerely believed that he was the Messiah, would fight to stop them from taking him away. They could have arrested him when he was in town buying supplies, but for some reason they chose not to. Instead, they placed some undercover agents in a small cabin that was situated right in front of the entrance to the compound. One of the agents, Robert Rodriguez, managed to befriend members of the group and get himself invited to a Bible study class where he could observe Koresh up close. The ATF concluded that Koresh was an imminent danger to society who could unleash his followers and their lethal force upon any target at any time. They decided that the best course of action was to stage a raid on his complex. The date was set for February 28, 1992. 
An hour before the raid was scheduled to go down, undercover agent Rodriguez went into the compound and showed Koresh that morning's copy of a local paper with its blazing headline, The Sinful Messiah, alongside a picture of Koresh. Koresh, who had already been informed that there was a buildup of law enforcement and media around the area, told Rodriguez that he knew that the ATF were about to attack. Upon exiting Mount Carmel, Rodriguez tried to warn his ATF bosses that Koresh already knew about the surprise raid. But it was too late. Fully armed agents were already closing in on the compound. To this day, it remains unclear as to which side fired first, but within minutes, a fierce firefight was underway. More than 70 ATF officers were secreted around the building, while army helicopters circled above. Inside, Branch Davidian members poured fire on the invaders who had come to take away their messiah. The shooting lasted for more than 60 minutes. Koresh was hit in the wrist, while six of his followers were shot dead. Four ATF agents were also killed. As the fighting continued, Koresh made a phone call to the local police department, urging that the raid be stopped. The request it fell on dead ears, and he hung up and proceeded to go upstairs. It was then that he was wounded a second time, this time more seriously. The bullet penetrated his hip, confining him to the floor. When the shooting ended, the ATF had multiple casualties and no David Koresh. The handling of the raid was roundly condemned, leading to intervention by the FBI. With worldwide attention now focused on Waco, the new men in charge were determined to end the standoff as quickly as possible. The final battle that Koresh had been proclaiming for so many years was now upon his followers. With him were 117 of the faithful, including 46 children. Nobody wanted to leave, but Koresh sent out 14 children, none of which were his offspring in the days after the raid. Koresh's main preoccupation during the siege, which was to last for 51 days, was to get his message about the Seven Seals out to the world. The raid had created a media frenzy, and he believed that he could capitalize on the publicity to get the word out. For hours on end, he proselytized over the phone to FBI negotiators. Three days after the raid, Koresh agreed to bring out all of his followers if he could get one of his sermons aired on the radio. This was duly complied with, but Koresh failed to live up to his side of the bargain, claiming that God had told him to hold off until he received further instruction. After two weeks, food, water, and milk for the young children was running dangerously low inside the compound. Koresh told his slowly starving followers that the hardship they were facing was a direct test of their faith in him. Things got worse when the FBI cut off all power to the complex and began playing loud music and shining blazing lights throughout the night in order to prevent the Branch Davidians from sleeping. Still, the people inside they would not budge. Koresh had been letting out a trickle of people thus far, but now he angrily declared that no one else would leave Mount Carmel so long as the government kept up the torment. An increasingly frustrated FBI now brought in Abrams tanks, which proceeded to smash and destroy all property outside of the compound, including vehicles. With the pressure tactics falling flat, the FBI allowed a defense attorney, hired by Koresh's mother, to go in and talk to his client. Koresh told the lawyer that he knew that the government would not let him live. Even though the FBI had offered to arrange for a worldwide television broadcast of his message if he promised to come out, his trust in them was shattered, and he refused the offer. There was a breakthrough of sorts on April the 14th when Koresh announced that God had instructed him to write down the entire message of the Seven Seals of Revelation. When this majestic work was completed as promised, the siege would be over and the Branch Davidians would come out. The Seven Seals offer, however, was never passed on to U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno, who on April the 17th authorized a plan to use tanks and tear gas to bring the siege to an end. The end began at 6 a.m. on April the 19th, when an FBI agent phoned Koresh and told him that tear gas was being placed in the building by mechanical arms attached to tanks. He stressed that it was not an assault and urged the Davidians not to fire their weapons. The tank smashed into the building as it delivered CS gas. Inside, the people were in agony, unable to breathe and feeling as if their throats and lungs were on fire. Still, nobody came out. After six hours, a fire erupted which quickly got out of control. Now, surely, Onlookers reasoned those inside would come out. But it wasn't to be. The fire raged through the building, killing 79 people, including 22 children. Koresh had made his way to the chapel. With the flames closing in, he died of a gunshot wound to the head. Nobody knows whether or not he claimed his own life. 
So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell so you get notified when we put out new videos. We normally do a couple of these every week. Some of them dark like this, others of them a little more light. So if you'd like that sort of stuff, hit subscribe and hit like. Also check out some other videos linked to on the screen now. And as always, thank you for watching.